Good morning. This is Rick Gleason and Don King coming to you from the heartbeat of worker health and safety on the campuses of the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, we're coming to you from the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences, which also includes the OSHA Region 10 Training Center. And we have a special guest today. So Don, could you tell us about our, our guest and uh, who's going to be speaking? Well, I certainly can. Uh, I had the um, good fortune of going to the um, Ellensburg uh, Central University um, Safety Day that is put on by the ASSE Puget Sound Group. And James was presenting. And I really, really enjoyed his presentation. And afterwards, I went up and said, would you be interested in doing a podcast with us? And he said, let's do it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to let James tell a little bit about himself. I know he's been in the business some 30 years, but maybe a quick synopsis of what you're about, James, and then we'll ask a couple of questions. Hey, thank you, Don, and thank you, Rick, as well, for having me on uh, today. So greatly appreciate it. Definitely enjoyed the uh, presentation, uh, delivering it, and I'm glad that you did as well. Uh, it was on gaining uh, safety leadership through influence and respect and knowledge. So it's a very interesting, timely topic. I think it's uh, ageless. It's something that we end up having to do with uh, with our organizations all the time. But um, more to your point, Don, um, I've actually been in the safety world and a practicing safety professional for over 30 years now and uh, have been a CSP. And funny enough, I kind of fell into safety, which I think a lot of people in the past have done. Uh, actually graduated with a business degree and then went to work for a company. And I thought, you know what? Safety is a very interesting area. It affects a business greatly, much more so than most businesses realize. Although I think these days they're beginning to realize much more. And so uh, started developing a career and getting an education in safety and uh, going from that direction. And uh, just a real quick little thing, um, I ended up working for a few organizations in the safety arena and uh, did some consulting work as well. And then eventually formed uh, my own company, which is, uh, which is, when we came to meet with you and do the uh, presentation there for the Central Washington uh, uh, Safety Day. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Don, but thank you for having me today. Yes, you're very welcome. So, uh, James, what, what Rick and I try to establish when we talk to people and what we're trying to get the workers and the management and everybody to understand is this, this world of safety is quite complex. So what we're looking for is some wisdom on experiences you've had with management that has made them turn the corner and what you feel maybe caused them to not recognize some of the serious things that they were up against. Mm, okay, sounds good. Um, well, I'll tell you, an answer for you is really uh, a bit complex. It certainly has not been one specific thing that has driven the turn. So if you don't mind, I'll kind of take it a little bit from the standpoint of what has caused them to not recognize safety and how the turn has been made, at least in our experience um, over the years. So essentially, a lot of times managers, uh, especially in the middle management ranks, that's what we tend to find over the years, is that the middle management ranks focus a lot on the financial aspects within the business. And in particular, they're responsible for budgets. As a result of that, when they do budgeting and planning, they tend to do it along the lines of wages and materials and any energy or overhead costs that might be for their departments as they go. And as you can imagine, safety is not usually contemplated in a budget system. Uh, what happens from that standpoint is when the safety professional approaches, because, of course, we've had the injuries, and now maybe that's going against the budget of that department, they become very uh, risk, well, I shouldn't say risk adverse, but certainly very adverse to the idea of spending any money or any time for uh, safety going 
going on in their part of the organization or anything that they might end up having to pay for. Now, if it's something that's internal and it's a budget which is not charged against the department, that tends to be okay. But for the most part, they tend to look at it from the standpoint that safety takes time out for training, as an example. And as a result of that, there's a loss of productivity, when in fact we all know that training really adds to productivity. When you give people the right skills to do the job correctly, they end up being much more effective, much more efficient. So we know that in general. But um, a lot of times it takes a bit of persuasion and convincing through a part of education, as well as a part of showing, as well as a part of giving some data and some material to that manager to show them that guess what? This can really help them out quite a bit, as well as start taking care of the issues that raise the injuries and uh, hence the costs associated with that department. So from that aspect, once that kind of information is presented, such as by doing training or doing certain types of safety activities that actually helps the bottom line of the department or the business, then the education can begin. And now what they really need is some hand-holding. So in our experience, we have found that the hand-holding is really what makes the difference. It's the communication, it's going through the process and proving that what you're doing and what safety professionals are bringing to the table is really helping them. Now, I know I'm talking in broad terms, but some of the things we have to think about are motivations. And some managers are motivated by money. Other managers are motivated by ego because they have a desire to ascend in the organization um, and look really good. Other managers are actually very much compassionate about their uh, employees and their human resources and therefore really truly want to provide the best possible working environment they can. So others are driven by production. Knowing this really helps the safety professional determine, okay, I know what I need to bring to the table, but how can I help this person understand how this can help them? And usually it ends up being a, a partnership where you are measuring either an increase in productivity or at least sustaining a certain level of productivity, or you're showing a benefit on the bottom line, or you're appealing to that compassion. So um, in our experience, that's what we've actually had. Okay. And uh, Don, did you want a specific, or, or I'll let you go ahead. Well, actually what I, what I have noticed uh, in my short career of 30 plus years is that information <laughs> such as the cost of their insurance and their loss impact is usually not known by the president or the vice president or their operations people. And that I find alarming because that would be a baseline with which to start talking about how important it is to their bottom line that they get this in line. And I just, I'm just amazed at how many people do not get that information. And I think this is exactly where you're going, is that the middle management has been trained and taught that you're here to improve the bottom line. And you're here to make sure that we don't overspend on certain things. And then when the safety balloon comes up in the air, that's like, whoa, that one definitely has to move to the side. So. <laughs> I, I would say I absolutely concur with you, and it is amazing how many business uh, leaders really don't understand that, uh, that impact that safety can have with regard to the insurance costs uh, and the bottom line with that. Um, and I think that's where the safety professional can actually help. Well, one of the things, though, I might offer as a suggestion or something to think about and something that we've done very recently with one of the, the people we work with is we actually approached the business leaders about safety culture and what it would look like and how you would attain that. It's very easy for us as safety professionals to talk about management commitment and how that leads to a culture. It's very difficult to get them to see that picture. And by doing that, you start opening the door to people who may be resistant, or don't really see that this financial component that you're talking about really does make a difference for them. So that's 
another avenue of actually getting them to open their mind or to educate them that to set that culture, they need to understand some of the foundational financial issues in the insurance area and how safety can help them with that. So does that make sense, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Rick, have you got something on your mind? Well, just this cost issue, and it came up here at the University of Washington just in the last couple of weeks. So we have about 40,000 workers here, faculty and staff and maintenance and two teaching hospitals. And uh, if you ask people, you know, by the way, who, who pays for workers' comp? Well, they're like, oh, we have a workers' comp department, <laughs> and they pay, they pay the cost. It's like, oh, well, you know, uh, and, and we, we had a... a premium of $20 million, and it went up 5%. Our experience mod factor went up 5%. So finally, we got management commitment because it increased a million dollars in one week when we got the new assessment for 2016. And so it was like, wow, we didn't realize how much this is costing us. It's like, well, yeah, <laughs> it's been costing us all along, but it's, it's, it's not a portion to each individual department. We've not been able to do that yet. But the more awareness we can get, I think the more uh, improvement uh, we can get out of your topic here. Yes, I, I would agree. And it's, it's interesting what you're talking about here. Um, we have a colleague uh, who is handling the University of California workers' comp budget, just like you said. And one of the things that he presented to the regents uh, at the UC system was the idea that, look, you're spending the money regardless. So you're either going to spend it in increased premium, which is supposed to offset the cost of the claims, or we can take a portion of that, spend it into the prevention, and reduce the cost of the premium as time goes on, which he did do. Over a four-year period, he actually saw a significant reduction I want to say it was somewhere around 16 to 20% over a four year period just by concentrating on uh, prevention efforts and putting just some money to that cause uh, for the top type of injury that was going on. So you can see this used the techniques and the tools of trending that safety professionals learn and then applied it to the cost structure around uh, something like the workers' compensation costs and the premiums, and they did see that dip. It was it, it was sustained, quite honestly. Uh, but they just picked the top type of injury they had, the most frequent, the most common, the most costly. They decided to determine what the causes were, figured out what the budget would be in order to put some effort and time resource there, and they implemented it. And he just kept reporting back to the regents. Uh, the progress, and it was very well done. I mean, he used enterprise risk management, and that would be something I would invite listeners to take a look at is enterprise risk management, or ERM, as it's known for short, that really helped the organization understand exactly what you're talking about, where the costs of the insurance aren't just a compliance issue or anything. There's also a financial and accounting and a productivity issue as well as different types of risks that are that expose the university. I mean, you can imagine what a million dollars could do for other programs at a university rather than going to a workers' compensation premium, as an example. Yeah. So uh, the question of the day then is, why why is it that this information you see, whenever you talk economics, um, there were, just recently they had an explosion in Korea in a tunnel, and four people yeah. died, and ten people were seriously injured. And at the bottom line of the injury investigation, it said, unfortunately, the companies over here tend to look at economics rather than looking at the human side of what needs to be done for safety. And I think when you talk economics and you say to a president of a company, if I were to tell you that in your safety department, they could actually be a profit center and there's tremendous savings for you in the company, would that be, would he look forward to that or would he say, well, I don't want my safety department to be a profit center? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting 
interesting question, and I think the answer and the reasoning behind it is, is more complex than one thing. Um, and if I may, I'll take a, I'll, I'll take a, a gander at this. Um, I think there's a couple of things at work here. I think, um, number one, I think the idea of finance around a safety program or a risk uh, improvement type of program or a risk control type of program is viewed as, quote, unquote, boring. Uh, it's not very high profile. It's usually something that is improvement in the background. Um, I think it's also something that a lot of people struggle and have difficulty measuring that something actually occurred, that there was an actual return. And there is a way to do that. I mean, yes, some of these things can be very complex, but we do find that businesses make decisions that affect millions of dollars, if not billions, on far less, you know, uh, vetted data. So I think that's a part of it. I think the other part of it is that, you know what, it will never happen to me. I've taken risks before, and understanding that a business is a risk adventure, and sure. all decisions made in the business are always a weighing of risk. In other words, if I do this, do I risk going out of business, or if I do this, do I risk gaining the kind of success I want? You know, risk can be both a positive and a negative thing. And I think that balance is why people don't always look at safety as one of those things that helps put risk in their favor. Now, having said that, I do know some enlightened you know, executives that absolutely would disagree with that statement I just said. But I'd say a preponderance of you know, the most people out there in business really don't understand that. I think part of it has to be an education on our part to let them know. Um, and I think the other part of it is helping them understand how these decisions, when they consider and factor in safety and a special safety as a financial um, thing, um, really helps from the human standpoint. I think a lot of people have, uh, you know, in business, we are very much in tune with the quarterly reporting, whereas businesses in other areas of the world are not in tune with quarterly reporting. They look more at a longer term, one year, five year type of time right, frame. Right. When that happens, I think they look at it from more of a humanistic standpoint. So, and by no means, Don, am I saying that anybody or Rick, you know, that anybody is saying that humans are expendable? No, no. Uh, 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 we're just yeah. no, we're just looking at different ways to again. Uh, a lot has to do with. If you look at how safety has come forward in the last 25 years, and how yeah. and the and just at looking at what what a safety professional costs to get him on your team nowadays tells you what their value is, and I think that Paul O'Neill probably is one of the better uh, examples yeah. of what it really means when you say we're going to do safety and. Uh, if there's something out there that needs fixing, you fix it. I'll figure out how to pay for it. We won't have a safety budget, yeah. you know. So yeah, I, I, I would agree, and and that's he is definitely an exception to the rule, but exactly. a great exception. Exactly. So go ahead. Sorry. So James, this is a kind of a, a great you know conclusion to think about this. Hey, why don't you give us the contact information so case anyone would, would like to get more information from you regarding this or other examples of safety and health? Sure, sure. Um, actually, they can just feel free to give me a call. Area code 559-679-8659. That's my direct line. Um, or certainly they can contact me at my email address, which is james at com. Oh, this is great, James. I certainly appreciate you coming on board uh, with us today and kind of just just getting us thinking about this whole issue and, and thoughts. And Don, do you have any uh, conclusion uh, remarks for us? Well, I guess uh, what I'm going to say is um, there's a great saying, and uh, the question is not what you look at, but what you see. And uh, so uh, if one uh, thinks about that a little bit, it really makes a lot of sense about what we're talking about. And Excellent. So, uh, yeah, agreed. All right. Well, uh, 
Thank you so much, James. And again, this has been Rick Gleason and Don King coming to you from the heartbeat of worker health and safety at the University of Washington. And thanks for listening and... And to all of you out there, a great aloha. Shake hands with danger. Meet a guy you ought to know. I used to laugh at safety. Now they call me. Never did things for the book. Just let me get my toolbox and I'll take myself a book. I climbed up on the dozer with my mechanic's pride. Said, you can keep it running, friend, while I poke around inside. Shake hands with danger, meet a guy you ought to know. I used to laugh at safety, now they call me Three Finger Joe. I forgot it soon enough The nicks and burns and scratches Showed the young ones I was tough Till another morning I was grinding on some steel 